So welcome everybody. This is a reformation of Science Council. Once a month, we're going to have a talk that's understood lab-wide for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is to educate yourself, so we're more cohesive as a unit across all sites and laboratories. And another one is that I've learned that people don't really understand the Magnet Lab. So when you go visit someone else or talk about us or give a talk, you might wanna invoke some of the stuff you learn here. What these are going to be are 30 minutes long, hard cut off, we'll have a speaker, and a discussion leader. And today our speaker is John Singleton, and I'm going to hand this over to Moon Chan, who's our discussion leader. Thank you, take it Moon. Okay, thank you, Laura. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome John Singleton. I'm sure a lot of you know who he is already. Um, uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, so John has been a staff member here at the Pulse Field facility at Los Alamos since 2002, I believe. And before that, he was a university lecturer at uh, Oxford, University of Oxford. Uh, he's done a lot of very exciting work in the past few years um, with Luli on this subject, uh, which is topological insulators and possible uh, new states of matter in these materials. Uh, so John will present for about 20 minutes, followed, about, fo followed by about 10 minutes of discussion. Um, because of the... Uh, virtual nature of this, it will be better if uh, questions are left till the very end, since we do have a lot of time for that. Um, of course, if you know if there are technical issues, like you can't hear him or his slides are not going, then feel free to interrupt. Uh, don't wait until the very end. Uh, and you can also ask questions through the chat. So without further ado, John, uh, take it away. Okay. Okay, I hope everyone can see my first slide. Um, please shout if you can't. Um, so I was involved very heavily in these experiments on uh, neutral fermions and the new state of matter, but um, I must thank uh, Zijie Jiang and Lu Chen, who were very, very heroic and skilled uh, postdoc and student of Lu Li uh, involved in all of these experiments. And we're also very grateful to our Japanese collaborators for very well-grown and very well-characterized samples. There's a third Lou, Helen Lou, who was a former Magnet Lab student who built quite a lot of the equipment for this. She's now doing a PhD in environmental engineering. So today's talk is pitched at a sort of level that's supposed to be for everybody. Um, so if there are really technical questions, uh, please um, leave them till the 10 minute discussion. I've got some more technical slides and I hope everyone is brought along by this. Anyway, our experience is that from a very young age, metals are good conductors of electricity and heat, and insulators are not. I found out about this by pushing a piece of my Meccano into a main socket when I was six years old and flying across the room. And when we get to high school, we find that the difference between these two things is because metals contain electrons that can move around and they carry the heat and the electricity. In insulators, the electrons are sort of more fixed in space, and so they can't. And maybe if we get to college and perhaps study some physics, uh, we find out that an electron is a fermion, which is a spin half particle obeying Fermi Dirac statistics. And we learn perhaps that a metal is a solid with a Fermi surface. Basically, quantum mechanics is writ large in simple metals. But for the past five years, this nice picture has been increasingly upset by insulators, such as ytterbium dodecaboride, which I'm going to talk about today, and samarium hexaboride and high magnetic fields and low temperatures. These things behave like metals, but they don't conduct electricity. So here's my running order. I'm first of all gonna say something about conventional metals, the electrons of fermions and the consequences that this has. Um, I'm gonna show you some of the things we look at, magnetic wiggles in particular, and tests for fermions that they give. And then I'll start to describe the strange properties of ytterbium dodecaboride in high fields. It looks like a metal, but it doesn't conduct electricity. And then we'll stray into clues from possible particle physics particles, Majorana fermions, um, or marijuana fermions, as one of my uh, colleagues calls them. And then at the end, I'll, if there's time, I'll tell you how we kill these neutral particles using high magnetic fields. So here's some things that metals do. 
First of all, their resistance or resistivity. Resistivity is just a sort of um, normalized resistance. It's electrical resistance, basically. Um, as a function of temperature, it decreases as you lower the temperature. Insulators do the opposite. <clears throat> also, seeing as we're a magnetic field laboratory, we like to put these metals into big magnetic fields. And what happens is properties like the magnetic susceptibility and the resistance on the right-hand side show these wiggles. And these wiggles you can see are getting further apart as you go to higher magnetic fields. It turns out that they're periodic in one over the magnetic field. Look at the lower right figure. You can see these data are for different temperatures increasing as we go upwards. And the wiggles are fading away with increasing temperature. Now, not shown, uh, but a significant thing for those of us who work in this field is that there's also a component of a metal's heat capacity at low temperatures that's proportional to the temperature T. And we'll use that later on to identify some key properties. So where does this all come from? Well, if you look at the top right, what we're going to use is a two-dimensional solid, a very simplified two-dimensional solid that we're going to put electrons in. And at the top right, I hope everyone is familiar with this equation. The kinetic energy of a slowly moving particle is given by half its mass times its velocity squared. If we put that in terms of the momentum, m times v, that gives us p squared over 2m. And now, of course, we're dealing with electrons. So we have to then think that they're sort of wave mechanically sort of things. And so using de Broglie's relationship, the momentum is expressed as Planck's constant over 2 pi times a wave vector or a wave number. So h bar squared, k squared. What's this thing on the bottom? Well, once we're in a solid, we're going to acknowledge that that's somehow going to modify the electron's energy. Anyway, turns out electrons can't move around in a solid exactly as they'd like to do. Um, their momentum is quantized. And I'm going to represent this with the diagram on the left. These little dots are the allowed momentum states in a momentum space, which is momentum along the y direction versus momentum along the x direction. Now, electrons are fermions. I've already said that. They obey Fermi-Dirac statistics. And the biggest thing about that is that only two of them, one with a spin up and one with a spin down, are allowed in each of these little dotty states here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put electrons into this solid, and there'll be two of them going on to each point. So here's the first eight of them. The green one is spin up. The red one is spin down. And notice that because the energy is going up like the square of the momentum, we're going to fill the states with the lowest energy, the ones closest to zero first. So let's put a few more in and a few more in and a few more in. And they keep filling up these states, getting further and further away from the origin of momentum. Bigger and bigger, more of them in. By this stage, you can start to see that this thing is looking like a circle. It's a sort of slightly grainy circle. So if we were to put a very large number of electrons in, the sort of numbers of electrons that you get in a typical metal, this thing is indistinguishable from a circle. So what you get is a situation like this. You have filled states within this circle, and you have empty states outside the circle. And the thing that divides the filled states from the empty states is a very important concept. We're going to call it the Fermi surface. Now, my late lamented colleague Jim Brooks used to liken filling this Fermi surface up to pouring beer into a beer glass. Once you've filled the lower half of the beer glass full of beer, you can't get any more beer into there. That's a very good analogy, but it neglects something, and that is that these are not stationary in space states. These things are momentum. So each one of these things is moving. And as we go further and further away from the origin, they move faster and faster. So by the time we've got the sort of densities we have in a real metal, these are very energetic. They're traveling at 2% of the speed of light. Uh, they have an energy of about two electron volts. And they exert a huge pressure. When you squeeze on a metal object, it's the pressure of these things pushing back against your hand that you feel. So anyway, most things that we look at are, to a certain extent, three-dimensional. And we can just extend our two-dimensional example like this. The little balls are the states in momentum space that we populate with the electrons. And we work out until we have this Fermi surface with energy EF, the Fermi energy that separates the filled from the empty states. And again, it's a surface in momentum space. It's not, not a kind of real space thing. These things at the surface are traveling pretty fast. 
So this has some consequences. <clears throat> so first of all, as we're a magnetic field, I will put a big magnetic field on it. And what this does is the magnetic field makes the electron circle around the Fermi surface at a frequency that's proportional to the magnetic field. The bigger the field, the faster they go. But of course, the correspondence principle in quantum mechanics says if you have a frequency like that, then this must correspond to energy levels spaced by that frequency. And these things are called Landau levels, technically. Their spacing is proportional to the magnetic field. Now, as we increase the magnetic field, these things push up through the Fermi energy that we saw late, earlier, and this results in the wiggles. So here are the wiggles, and that's coming because of this circling motion. Now, the frequency of these wiggles, because they're periodic in one over the magnetic field, remember they get further apart as we go to higher field, their frequency is in Tesla. And it turns out that this thing is proportional to this cross-sectional area of this orbit of the Fermi surface. So if we get wiggles, we can tell how big the Fermi surface is. Second thing is, because the oscillations are due to fermions, their temperature dependent is determined entirely by Fermi-Dirac statistics. And this means that their amplitude, you see as they're going to higher temperatures on the right-hand side diagram, are getting less, is governed by this formula here. If these oscillation amplitudes obey this formula, it means that these wiggles are due to fermions. So here's a reminder of the consequence of having a Fermi surface filled with fermions. In So far, it's been electrons, but we're going to see uh, other things in a moment. First of all, in a big magnetic field, we get wiggles. These can be so-called de Haas van Alphen oscillations in the magnetization. They can be Shubnikov de Haas oscillations in the resistivity or resistance. And you can measure all sorts of other things that wiggle as well, like the sample length. And these things have a temperature dependence, which is determined by the fact that fermions are causing them. Also, another fermionic property is the electrical resistivity falls as T decreases. And at low temperatures, we have a component of the heat capacity, which is proportional to temperature. Having said all this, we now move on to the weird materials. So here is a terbium dodecaboride. It is basically cubic, um, but that's quite difficult to see because there's a cluster of these borons around each terbium um, ion. And uh, it's basically face center cubic though. On the right side is its resistivity or resistance plotted as a function, uh, plotted in logarithmic units. And then this temperature on the bottom axis is also plotted in logarithmic units. And you can see that as we cool down, the resistance increases and increases and increases. The electrical resistivity goes up as the temperature falls. It's an insulator, very definitely not a metal. So what's happening, just a little bit of tiny technical stuff, the mobile electrons are interacting with the localized states which are sitting on the ytterbium ions. And what happens is that causes a band gap to open up at low temperatures. And so because of this band gap, um, the system is an insulator and its resistivity increases because as you go to lower and lower temperatures, fewer and fewer electrons can get excited across this gap. Anyway, we have a definite bona fide insulator. And one of our first experiments was to try to collapse this gap by putting a big magnetic field on it. And here's what we saw. So here is the resistance, and here is magnetic field along the bottom axis. There are various different temperature data shown here in different colors. Above 45 Tesla, the resistance gets very low and uh, it's more or less field independent. So what's happened is we did collapse the gap. We've made a metal up here. Below that, the thing is still an insulator. It has a big resistivity. But wait a minute, there are wiggles. These look like Shubnikov to Haas oscillations, and they are definitely periodic in one over the magnetic field. So they look like bona fide wiggles due to fermions, but they're in an insulator. This thing has a very high resistance. So if you see oscillations in resistance, the next step is to go to the Tallahassee hybrid magnet and look for them in magnetization as well. And this uses a little piece of apparatus called a torque magnetometer. There's a photo of it on the lower left. Basically, it's a capacitor. The sample is glued to the upper part of the, of the capacitor, the upper electrode. And uh, because of the magnetization, there's a torque on this, which just bends the thing slightly, opens up the gap or closes it, and changes the capacitance. So you can use a measurement of the capacitance to get the torque. And uh, here we have the torque signal for the sample at two different angles and uh, function of magnetic field. You can tell it's the hybrid because it goes 11 upwards. And you can see, we see these oscillations here. 
and they're exactly the same periodicity as the oscillations in the resistance, but they're in the magnetization. So why is this a big deal? Well, magnetization is a thermodynamic function of state. You can basically do thermodynamics on your model of fermions, your microscopic model, and with no assumptions, essentially, get this magnetization out. This means that oscillations that you see in the magnetization are pretty certain evidence for fermions. So remember the second test I told you as well as the wiggles, the wiggles have a temperature dependence. So the left side here, we plot the amplitude of the wiggles as a function of temperature, and we compare it with this formula that should be obeyed if these things are fermions due to Fermi-Dirac statistics. And you can see that the formula, which is this pinkish curve, fit the data pretty well. There's a side effect of this, which means we can get the effective mass, that parameter I mentioned earlier, out of this as well. But basically, the excellent fit means that these wiggles are reflecting uh, Fermi-Dirac statistics. They're almost certainly due to fermions with the Fermi surface. We know its size and the effective mass of the fermions. So we can also look for fermions in the thermal properties. There's a contribution to the heat capacity, which is proportional to the temperature. Um, so if you plot C over T, the heat capacity over the temperature, this comes out as a constant with the other contributions in here. This basically is an extraction. Here are the other contributions, these curves. Here are the experimental data, these dots, and the inset shows the extracted gamma. It is a constant. So we see a, thermal, we see a fermion contribution to the heat capacity, but this thing is still an insulator. So what we're getting is strong evidence for mobile fermion, fermions in this material. We get quantum oscillations, the wiggles. We get a, that means there's a Fermi surface. We have a contribution to the heat capacity and also something I didn't have time to talk about, the thermal conductivity. But they're not normal free electrons. They don't carry charge. So one possibility is Majorana fermions. Majorana fermions, I'm saying it. And these are neutral spin half particles described by a real, real wave equation. They're basically still debated as to whether they might be a model for neutrinos. So how could these neutral things be made in a solid? Well, ytterbium dodecaboride is a so-called mixed valence system. The, variant, the valence of ytterbium can vary. So let's so do a really simplified cartoon of what this might do. The orange thing is the ytterbium ion, and the blue is its surroundings of the mobile electrons. So let's start off with the thing in its uh, average valence, n plus. There are n electrons around it. It changes valence in the center cartoon to n plus 1 plus. So now to maintain charge neutrality, there must be n plus 1 electrons around it. Here it's allowed to, on the right hand side, fluctuate downwards to n minus 1 plus. So there must be n minus 1 electrons around it. Now, a missing electron, like the n minus 1 electrons on the right side, is called a hole it basically behaves like an extra mobile positive charge. So now what we're going to do is let the valence fluctuate. And basically what you're going to get is a sort of fluctuating momentary population of electrons and holes. And we postulate that the neutral fermions are an equal superposition of the electrons and holes generated by the fluctuations. They have no net electric charge. So I've got one time for one brief prophecy about this. And uh, the neutral fermions uh, in this model, they're stationary states. They live forever in a perfect periodic infinite crystal. But of course, a real crystal contains all sorts of defects and has surfaces. It's not infinite. So we get a decay of the neutral fermion. It has a finite lifetime. But of course, it's a superposition of charged electrons and holes. So the decay products, these electrons and holes, carry electricity. Once the thermal excitation across the band gap has stopped, this conduction will dominate once these excitations have died away. So basically the prediction is the samples with the highest saturation resistivity are the most defect free. So they'll also show the strongest quantum oscillations. And that's true. This is an example from a recent paper of ours. Basically samples with a very, very high resistivity at low temperatures show the strongest quantum oscillations. Well, I see I've got to my 20 minutes um, if someone wants to ask about how these things die in high fields, I will, I will tell you, but um, I'll go to my summary. Um, the properties of ytterbium dodecaboride are probably understandable in terms of um, the following. In the low field, this thing is a two-fluid picture. 
of low density of charge carrying electrons and holes cohabiting with the Fermi surface of neutral fermions. When we get into the high field metallic state, the thing I've not had time to, to talk about, you have a Fermi surface of heavy electrons cohabiting with the Fermi surface of neutral fermions, and they gradually get killed as we increase the magnetic field. So anyway, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, this medium means I can't see your eyes glazing over, uh, so I hope some of you did stay awake. But anyway, um, I think we'll hand over to Mun now for questions. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, that, that really went by really quickly, uh, which is, <laughs> I think, a good sign. That was a fantastic talk. And uh, it was, uh, even for me, who have heard, I've heard the more technical version of this, and I, I still learned quite a bit from it. So thanks again. Um, we are, I think I'll just have a kind of an open discussion with anyone who might have questions, uh, either in chat or you can interrupt. Uh, for now, there is a question in the chat by Lance Cooley. Does the orientation of the B12 balls in the unit cell affect the fermionic properties? Um, yes, okay, so let's, uh, th there are several different aspects to that. Um, full screen mode, okay. So one, one of the things is um, that there, there is a slight angle dependence of the frequency of the oscillation. So uh, uh, what's the easiest way to show that? Um, uh, oops, <laughs> I thought I had a slide about this. But bas basically, okay, I'm plotting here the frequency of the oscillations given by the index of the oscillations um, against one over the magnetic field with an offset in it. And these are for different angles of the sample in the magnetic field. So what it looks like is, uh, is that you get a slight change in the shape of this neutral fermion uh, Fermi surface as you change the angle. It probably looks something like a sphere with flattened sides, or if you like, a kind of rounded cube um, so, yes, the magnetic field orientation does allow you to map out this, this, uh, uh, the, the anisotropy of this Fermi surface. It, it has 90 degree symmetries you'd expect for a cubic system, also threefold symmetry about the 111 direction, but it, it isn't a sphere. It's um, some sort of slightly flattened side thing. Was that the question, Lance, or, or uh, were you thinking of something else? No, that, that, that's fine. It, and. Uh... You know, these various um, ball, pea pod, you know, sort of cluster shapes are all very interesting. And, and their topography is a subtopic of the broader topic you're, you're discussing here. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I ask you a question then? Sure. So you say this is an insulator, but at low temperatures, you have this finite resistivity. For a lot of people working in insulators, they would say an insulating behavior implies no finite conductivity at, low, at limited low temperatures. So the, the fact that you see a saturation plateau, um, how do you explain it? Is this, what is producing conductivity? If it is, is it your Majorana Fermi surfaces? Yes, Why? it is, yes. Now, I'll go back to this figure. I didn't have very much time to explain. So basically, um, the, these, uh, these neutral fermions um, have, have a finite lifetime, and the lifetime is shorter the more disorder there is in the material. And the disorder seems to come from two contributions. One is things like vacancies, but the dominant one um, seems to be the surface. Um, and so what's happening is that where you get these scattering centers, the, the fermions um, you know, break up into electrons and holes, and those provide conductivity. And so the strong evidence for this, which, which I sort of described probably too fast before, is that the more perfect the crystal, the longer lived the neutral fermions would be. And therefore, um, the higher the resistivity, because there'd be fewer electrons and holes around. On the other hand, the short, the, the more disordered the crystal, the lower the low temperature resistivity will be because there'll be more of these electrons and holes as decay products. Also, the more perfect the crystal, the longer the neutral fermions will live to give several circuits of the Fermi surface to give you the Landau levels. So we have this interesting prediction that 
if you have a very high resistance sample in the saturation region, that means that your neutral fermions live a long time. And it corresponds to very strong oscillations in the resistivity and the torque. On the other hand, if you have a sample which is more disordered, it has a lower resistivity in the low temperature region, and it has very weak oscillations in, uh, in, in the resistivity and the torque. So basically, well, th th this is showing that it's the sort of decay rate or the survival time of the neutral fermions that determines this saturation. And um, there's a lot of, uh, we, we have a paper submitted to X, but if you search on me and Lou at the archive, it's available on the archive. So we've compiled a lot of the evidence there for that, which is also based on Hall effect as well. A last question, but one final question. You said that the, the gap that you extract in the order of a few millilitron volts, right? Four or five millilitron volts, mm -hmm. which is in the order of magnitude of your 45 Tesla. That's why you're killing um, this insulating state. So what is happening to this Majorana like particles as you are suppressing the gap? Are they, are they proliferating? What do you think is happening? So they, 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 they are surviving. Um, they're, they're, they're quite difficult to characterize because the background resistance as you suppress the gap is also changing a lot with temperature. But um, one of the things that we notice is that this is the frequency. So this is the frequency and therefore the cross-sectional area of the Fermi surface as a function of magnetic field. And so the frequency of the quantum oscillations, the wiggle shown by the neutral fermion stays the same um, roughly 700 Tesla with those slight variations I told about to, to, to Lance before. But once you go through the phase transition, we can trace the oscillations essentially almost immediately on the other side of the phase transition. And it, it seems certain that the same oscillations that we're seeing in the high field metallic state are due to this piece of Fermi surface, but it's dying. It's collapsing. The frequency is tending to zero, somewhere around um, 78 Tesla. And uh, so basically once you have this metallic state there cohabiting with the neutral fermions, the neutral fermions are becoming more and more unstable. They'd like to be part of the normal Fermi C. And so we see the Fermi surface oscillations collapsing and going away. But the oscillations are very strong, so we can, we can track this reliably. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Ross, did you have a question? You had your hand raised. I want to make sure everyone else has a chance to, to ask things, but this is, if not, this is kind of related to Lewis's question, perhaps, but thinking more about the temperature dependence. So you look at the temperature dependence of your oscillations from a, an effective mass perspective with an LK analysis. Is there any indication that, that you have a temperature dependence there that represents a condensation of the neutral quasi-particle? No, there's not. No, the, the disappointing, well, <laughs> disappointingly, uh, uh, disappointingly, depending on what your point of view is. So, no, the, these things really do look robustly like fermions. The, um, so the magnetization oscillations have never been a problem for us. They, their amplitude uh, obeys the LK formula. You get out a nice effective mass and all of that sort of thing. The resistivity oscillations in that archive paper that we put on the archive a couple of months back, um, we explain their temperature dependence. The reason is the normalization that you have to do to get out the true amplitude of the resistivity oscillations. And because there's, you know, decaying uh, neutral fermions giving you electrons and holes, because as Louis said, the gap is closing, so there's more thermally excited electrons and holes, you have to be very careful in the way that you normalize out the resistivity oscillations. But once you take due care in that following Pippard's principles, um, you do get the same LK variation, you get the same effective mass coming out as in the magnetization oscillations. But from the magnetization, from the thermodynamic measurement, the oscillations exist through the kind of shoulder in the temperature dependence of resistivity where it sort of kinks and saturates. Yeah, and yes, it does. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, uh, a lot of detail is in, is in this most recent paper that's on the archive. But we, we, we're actually seeing that there, there are possible um, Lifshitz transformations going on in the uh, neutral fermion um, uh, Fermi surface at, at lower fields. And um, so that's why there's this restricted region over which you can see the, the, high, the, 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 the 700 Tesla series.
uh, restricted region of field. But it's not due to something weird happening. It's, it's uh, once you do the Hall effect and the conductivity and the magnetization all on the same samples, it's, it's consistent where this is coming from. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Okay. Thanks. So I guess we should go to Joanna, Joanna first, and then oh. maybe some of the questions in the chat. Okay, uh, going back to the temperature dependence of the resistivity, where is the mod limit for this material? Um, well, nowhere that we get to uh, because uh, the, this is, these are exceptionally clean crystals. So, um, I mean, one of the things that was kind of implied, maybe I can just go to a slightly, yeah. So why, uh, I mean, I, I see where you're coming from. Why are you seeing these quantum oscillations in the resistivity here? Um, well, even in conventional metals, quantum oscillations are a bit hard to model and you, Pippard's argument is, is that you have a golden rule. The density of states um, at the Fermi energy is being modulated by the magnetic field, so the amount of scattering is modulated, and so the resistance is being modulated as well. So here we have a slightly more complicated situation, but you have um, the neutral Fermi on Landau levels, which have a sort of spiky density of states as a function of energy, and then there's this sort of dilute electron and whole gas and surface states, which has sort of got a nebulous density of states. And it's the scattering between them that means that the quantum oscillations coming from the neutral fermion Landau levels are manifested in this very, very high resistivity here. Um, so it's not a classical sort of MOT situation at all. It's, it's you have something like a narrow gap semiconductor, but the scattering in that narrow gap semiconductor is being modulated by an available density of states of something that doesn't contribute to the electrical conductivity. Um, but again, uh, as in this most recent paper, we, we sort of go into this in some detail and this does seem to be able to account for the conductivity phenomena that we've seen. So it's not, it's not you know, because it's a two component system, it's difficult to say something about, you know, what would this, what would the MOT limit for this be? And it's also an extremely clean system as well as manifested by all the scattering times and things that we get out of this. Okay, so uh, I think we're running a bit short on time. Perhaps you can have Joanna, Joanna give the last question. Do you, do you want to ask a question, Joanna? Okay, um, I'm going to ask a 30,000 foot view question since this is definitely way outside of my area of expertise, but in the interest of being able to talk about it intelligently. First of all, thank you for explaining things in the first 10 minutes in a way that I could follow. <laughs> that was very You're much welcome. appreciated. So I have kind of a chicken and an egg question, you know, because normal metals, normal insulators, we, we just get those by observation. How did you arrive at this material? Was it the chemist thinking about valency? Was it the physicist thinking about fermion surfaces? And how difficult is this type of material to make and how chemically stable is it? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, these oscillations were first um, observed in a material called samarium hexaboride, uh, but there are all sorts of materials, questions about samarium hexaboride. For example, there's a strong opinion that the oscillations in that material are caused by um, the aluminum flux that's used in the growth of the crystals. And so there's lots of debate. So we went looking for a material that shows the same sort of condo insulator physics, but where the crystals were exceptionally clean, they're made in a light furnace, and also where uh, our Japanese collaborators have done completely beyond due diligence characterization of their crystal structure, their purity, their freedom from other phases. I mean, ytterbium can do like YBB38 and various other weird things like that. And so it's been determined that all of these things are not in our crystals and they're exceptionally pure and they're free from uh, vacancies and they're free from uh, flux and all of that sort of business. So really this, this is a sort of second attack on this problem, um, but trying to use a material that was free from the controversy, controversies of the early Sumerium hexabora observations. So it's, it's kind of finding a material that shows similar physics. The mixed valence physics has been known since the late 80s um, here at Los Alamos, actually. And um, then, uh, you know, looking to see that you can get exceptionally well characterized and very pure crystals. So all credit to our Japanese co-workers for that. Thanks. 
Hey, th thank you so much. Uh, there looks to be a lot more questions, which is a good sign that this this was, I think, a very successful talk and a good idea. Um, however, I, I realize that there are people who have to go to other meetings. So, John, if you don't mind, uh, do you mind do you mind just staying around for a couple of minutes to discuss uh, things yes, with yeah. uh, other people? And I guess those who have to leave for other meetings can do so. Is that, does that sound like a good That's idea? That's a great idea, Moon. I have to leave myself. And uh, this was the first MAGX talk, and maybe we still have to work out the timing. Uh, Moon, you were a great discussion leader. John, that was an awesome talk. Thank you. And the next one is three, two, 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 two. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll take any kind of uh, anybody that wants to give the next MAGX talk, and you guys carry on, and I'm taking off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. Uh, okay. Thank questions. you so much. Um, so, so John, you're fine with just a couple more questions. I guess there are a few on the chat. Sure, yeah. Um, so, so I guess Greg had uh, had what? No, uh, yeah, Greg had one. Explain again why the Fermi surface is shrinking in magnetic fields above 40 tesla, 45 tesla, i.e., in the condo metal state. Yes, okay, so um, let me just go back to here uh, to show the data that um, that we're talking about here. So ba basically, um, yeah, so we see these uh, the, these frequency dependent oscillate, these field dependent oscillation frequencies. And um, <clears throat> it is one of the predictions that these things will find it more difficult to exist if there's a lot of screening around. So, uh, in the in the insulating state, uh, basically uh, the density of electrons and holes is either due to thermal excitation across the gap or due to the neutral fermions themselves uh, dying and crashing. And so there's not many of those around. So there isn't very much um, screening here, so that the the uh, the holes and the electrons produced by the fluctuating valence um, can become this failed condensate. They can interact and uh, become these composite particles with spin half. On the other hand, once you get into the uh, metallic phase at high magnetic fields, there's a very large density of heavy conventional electrons around, and they will act to screen the interactions between the, um, the electrons and holes that you're trying to make up the neutral, uh, the neutral fermions. So um, as the magnetic field increases, this, this, this metal state with the conventional electrons in gets more and more stable. And I think it just becomes more and more difficult for the neutral fermions to, to bind themselves together. And eventually, they just collapse and, and, and wither away. Also, um, Chandravarma told me uh, that um, the presence of normal conventional electrons around Will it will mean that it's more energetically favorable for any fermions that happen to be around to to sort of collapse into that Fermi C. Um, so 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 I think it's a combination of those two things. It's the predicted these things find it hard to exist when there are other um, there are other fermions around and and the screening coming from the metal metallic state. Did that answer the question? There's a theory that says it goes as one over B minus B B naught. No, that, that's that, that's weird. That comes from my time in the quantum um, quantum uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, you know, composite fermion model. I, I suggested we plot them like that, and it turned out it's true. But here, I think that's um, that is an empirical observation. So um, okay. here we are. So this is this is the index of the oscillations um, plotted against. Um, plugged against one over the magnetic field with an offset field in it. And um, <clears throat> so it, it is a pretty good fit, but uh, no one has come up with a theory for this. I think it's just an empirical way of, uh, of fitting what's going on. Okay, thanks. So I posted a question in the chat. Uh, so uh, let me uh, maybe elaborate that a little bit. So in the ordinary metal, the surface is very uh, robust because it's actually protected uh, as a topological invariant uh, via the uh, Ludinger theorem. So basically the volume of the Fermi surface is fixed, although the shape can change. So I'm actually wondering uh, what sets the scale or the size of the neutral Fermi surface and how is it actually protected? Because uh, 
as far as I can tell, these neutral fermions are not conserved in, uh, in number, and uh, therefore the Fermi surface uh, is not protected by anything. Well, the, the answer to that is um, I, I don't think that's fully understood yet. And the surprise for me has been exactly what Luis said, that, that um, you know, you are, as you increase the magnetic field towards 45 Tesla, you are collapsing this band gap. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, um, Chandravarma told me that he had some, some ideas about this, that as long as there is some sort of... Um, mid gap as it were state around there uh, then the 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 neutral fermions will 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 have in effect a sort of stable band structure so i think that's a, that's the closest i've got to having some sort of ex, um, explanation of that but um uh, i've got the uh there we are yeah <clears throat> so chandra's paper is on the it's in fizra b now but it's also on the archive um and it's it's worth reading on that one of his other predictions is and I don't know if this helps you at all or not, but um, if I just go back to the oscillations in the, once we get into the condo metal phase, these oscillations show actual um, splitting due to spin. So basically the, once you get the neutral fermions into the condo metal phase, they have a spin splitting due to, due to the, the G factor and what have you. In the uh, condo insulator phase, that is not there. Basically, uh, the, 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 any sort of splitting of the lambda levels due to a finite G factor does not exist. And so apparently the fact that we see this is, is a sort of confirmation of, um, of trying to sort of view of these things as composite electron holes behaving as uh, Majorana fermions. Now, uh, uh, but, yeah, uh, but just, I would have to say... From, from the oscillation, you should be able to extract the size of the Fermi surface, right? Yes, well, what yes. What does it look like? Well, as I said in answer to Lance's question, it, it's like a sphere that's got kind of compacted somewhat on, it, on its sides. So um, uh, here you can see that the oscillations, This is these are PDO data just as we enter the, uh, uh, the, the, the high field phase. The oscillations do vary with angle, and the same is true in the low field phase as well. So it looks like a, a sort of slightly, uh, it's like a sphere that's got squashed, or if you like, a cube that's got rounded. And um, so as you tilt, the frequency both in the low field phase and the high field phase does vary. Um, and, and so it's not perfect. It's not a sphere. It's, it's somewhat distorted from that. Yeah, I guess uh, I didn't make myself clear enough. So when I, uh, when I say the, the shape, I really meant its volume. So whether you can actually uh, extract something like the density of these neutral fermions from the volume. And what, what, what would you relate to? Yes, you can. So, so the volume and the effective mass are, are in agreement with the, um, with the gamma parameter here. So the, 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 the Sommerfeld coefficient uh, is, is in good agreement with the volume of the Fermi surface and its effective mass. So you know that this fermion contribution to the heat capacity is, de is definitely coming from something like the Fermi surface that we measure and uh, there's consistency. So if you want to, uh, if you want to model this, if you want to come up with a theory of it, then this will be a good density of states to work with. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think we've taken up quite a bit of John's time already. Um, <laughs> if, the, if anyone has like something that's really burning and short, they can ask it. Or if not, I guess you can just take it offline. If anyone wants to talk to John further, I'm sure he'll be happy. Just uh, drop me an email, to, and to uh, the, yeah, you know, we can do we can do zooms, uh, other zooms and things if you want as well. So um, yeah, uh, email is fine. J single l a n l dot g o v, and uh, I'll be pleased to engage in further talk about this. Okay. So thank you very much to everyone and to John, of course, um, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>